Let's continue. Before proceeding with our gloss of chapter 23, we should contemplate a number of asses to which Cervantes may allude throughout his novel. We have Buridan's philosophical ass of moral indecision, Plato's ass of democratic tyranny, Salinas' ass of the cult of laughter, the myth of King Midas with the ears of an ass, Apuleius' ass of sexual and moral metamorphosis, the Bible's sacrificial and anti-imperial ass on which Christ enters Jerusalem, the legendary ass of Mary and Joseph, Plautus' satire, the comedy of asses, and even Euclid's bridge of asses as a defining instance of geometrical and mathematical reasoning. Which of these nine or more donkeys do you see in Don Quixote? I have to confess that I believe that Cervantes' novel displays a combination of many of them. If you think about it, Don Quixote investigates the philosophical and political dilemmas posed by the perplexing ethnic identity of a Spanish hero around 1605. Cervantes seems to have had in mind some combination of self-directed laughter designed to signal both anti-militant humility and a culture relatively more respectful toward women. Similarly, at the end of the 1605 novel, the heavy references to the Christian ass allow Cervantes to question the expulsion of the Moriscos that was about to be ordered by Philip III. And thanks to the influence of Apuleius's original picaresque, the ass references in Don Quixote are cosmically intertwined. Finally, I would argue that the ass seems related to the marketplace. In other words, contractual relations based on the exchange of money for services instead of the traditional organic relations at the heart of the medieval caste system. We might call this the economic ass of Salamanca because it appears in connection with the Spanish picaresque, which for its part was heavily influenced by the neo-Aristotelian philosophy of the University of Salamanca around the middle of the 16th century. Returning to the action of chapter 23, we note that the details of the rest of the episode have everything to do with a lost donkey. Sancho looked up and saw that his master had halted and was trying to raise something off the ground with the tip of his lance. This turns out to be a saddle pad along with a small suitcase that was attached to it. The case is bound by a chain, but because it is rotted through, Sancho easily opens it and finds four shirts of fine white linen and then, wrapped inside a handkerchief, a nice pile of gold escudos. Sancho's reaction is priceless. Blessed be the whole of heaven, which has finally bestowed upon us a profitable adventure. Don Quixote is magnanimous with the suitcase's money. He ordered him to stow the money and keep it for himself. As we might expect, Sancho kissed his hands in gratitude. This scene may be one of history's most sophisticated parodies of the Spanish Reconquista. If we look closely, it also contains an ironic echo of the Fulling Mills episode. Our heroes find textiles along with a sum of money that more than compensates Sancho for his services. In fact, according to his normal wages as a farmhand, which Sancho will give us in chapter 28 of part two, these more than 100 escudos found in the Sierra Morena and then bestowed on him by Don Quixote amount to more than four years of work by our peasant squire. For a moment, Don Quixote adopts the attitude of a detective, speculating that the valise indicates that a traveler must have been assaulted by robbers. But Sancho rectifies this logic. If it were thieves, they would not have left this money. With that, we move on to another object of interest contained by the suitcase, a richly bound diary, which Don Quixote wants to read in order to disclose the knowledge we seek. Notice how reflexive and metatextual this is. We are ourselves reading a book seeking knowledge regarding any number of details. The booklet contains a sonnet and a letter. The sonnet tells of a frustrated love affair between an unknown poet and a certain fili, a typical poetic name for the beloved, which indicates a joyous person who brings happiness to others. Aside from the novel's preliminary poems, this is its first sonnet. It must be important. And so it is. It functions as a dense summary of the theme of love that we have seen elsewhere. Love causes torment and requires a medical remedy if the poet lover is not to commit suicide. Soon I will have to die, of that I am sure, because an evil whose cause cannot be known wants no less than a miracle for its cure. This same sonnet appears in one of Cervantes' plays, The House of Jealousy, which indicates once again 
that love is problematic throughout Cervantes' works, almost always to the extent that it causes rivalry. The conversation between Sancho and Don Quixote about the poem seems superficial, but it highlights the problem of literary interpretation. Sancho even inserts a complex metaphor, saying that the poem is an enigma unless there's some way for that filament to lead us back to the coil. Sancho has heard the word thread, hilo, instead of the name fili. Note how reasonable this is, for Don Quixote often prefers to substitute a medieval F for the modern H. Don Quixote corrects Sancho, adding that all knights were great poets and musicians, and even vowing to write a letter entirely in verse to my lady Dulcinea of Toboso. The phrase, the thread leads back to the coil, por el hilo se saca el ovillo, is one of Cervantes' favorites. It expresses the idea of deciphering something that is not self-evident by starting with the details and then moving on to the big picture. We saw it in the episode of The Merchants of Toledo. Interestingly enough, Sancho will use the exact same expression when he recovers his ass in the addendum to chapter 30. So we have to associate the phrase with, one, the production of textiles, two, the role of women as love objects, and three, the problem of Sancho's missing ass. What a labyrinth. Incidentally, we also should connect all of this to the myth of Theseus when he killed the Minotaur on the island of Crete. Returning to the case, what remains is the letter, which is just as complicated as the poem. Once again, a man complains that he has been betrayed by a woman. At least now we learn that she left him for a man who is richer, but also morally suspect. You tossed me aside, O oh ungrateful woman, for one who has more than I, but not one of greater value. We also learn that the writer of the letter now despises the woman for her unbridled sexuality. What your beauty constructed, your actions have demolished. From the prior, I thought you to be an angel, and from the latter, I know you are a woman. Peace be with you, cause of my war. War. The letter is ominous enough on a personal level, but now it has international connotations. The last detail that interests us is the reference to a possible revenge, which apparently the scorned man does not wish to have to take. Both the poem and the letter remind us of Antonio's ballad and Grisostomo's desperate song.